We're living in a grumpy world, and I think most of you see that. It seems like we've lost our mind as a nation, and it seems like there's nowhere to turn except to the Lord Jesus Christ in this. And we've started the whole idea, if you remember correctly, talking about the fact that most people are grumpy people in this world today because they've made the mistake of tying their joy to their circumstances. All of us know that every day in our life, sometimes things go really well, and sometimes they go really bad. Sometimes they ebb and flow. Sometimes we have all good days and bad days all in the same day. And if you make the mistake of tying your joy to that ebb and flow in life, you're going to have a miserable life. You're going to have up times and down times, sometimes in the same hour. There's a different way to do that. And I, I chose Paul in this example we have in the book of Philippians because this book, every word that we've looked at and that we'll look at today was written from a Roman dungeon. He's literally in a hole in the ground, probably chained to a soldier in some way. And in this horrible place, in this horrible time in his life, he's there for preaching the gospel, which is not a bad thing to do. He doesn't know what the future holds. He mentions joy 16 times in only 104 verses of Scripture. An amazing thing to even think about. And so he demonstrates for us, he doesn't just talk about it, he demonstrates for us what it means to tie your joy, not to your circumstances, but to your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will make the, 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 really the greatest move you'll ever make in your life to say, you know, I'm not going to tie my joy to my circumstances, but instead to the bedrock of who Jesus is, no matter what happens in your life, good, bad, or ugly, it's not going to steal the joy in your life. So if we talk about that, it's really important to make sure we understand the distinction between happiness and joy because they are not the same thing. Happiness absolutely is tied to your circumstances. Happiness is you got paid today. Happiness is your wife's really in a good mood today and it's been tough lately and you're just so thankful to have that one day she's happy. And maybe it's your husband's not grumpy today and thank God for that. Happiness is that I got to go out on a date with my wife or I got to go eat something I really like to eat or go do something I like to do. Whatever it may be, that is certainly what happiness is. The problem with that is sadness is part of that too. When it doesn't work out the way you have, there's certainly sadness that comes. But if your joy is tied to your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's tied to the bedrock of who he is, it never ebbs and flows like that. Regardless of what circumstance you find yourself in, your joy will supersede your circumstances. It's not tied again to your circumstances. It's tied to a God who never changes, who never ebbs and flows, a God who loved you so much and he loved me so much that he sacrificed his very life for you and he was resurrected from the dead and he's alive today. And because of that, you can have joy in your life regardless of your circumstances. So I thought about a text that might, might really fall in line with what he's talking about today, which is the idea that we cannot just gain joy for our lives, but we can give joy away. Because this here's the amazing thing. He's not even demonstrating just that he has joy in this horrible place he's at. He's giving joy away from a prison. Think about that. He's not just taking the time to let them know, you know, hey, it's all worked out for the good for the gospel. I'm being able to share the gospel with these guys that are chained to me. And you think this is a horrible thing, but it's actually turned out for a good thing for the gospel. And oh, by the way, when I think about you and when I pray for you, there's joy that swims around in my heart and things like that. He's saying, not only am I enjoying joy in this place that maybe I should not have joy, I want to make sure you understand where this joy comes from. And so you and I can not just gain joy for our lives, we can also give that joy away. And as I've said to you, the one nasty thing I've not liked about being on Facebook, because COVID made me get on Facebook, y'all know that. People were chiming in wanting to ask me questions, and they said, you need to have your own Facebook page. And I've really enjoyed it. I've met, met some new people, and, and I've met some old friends that I didn't know about that, that still were staying in touch with me, and it's been a good thing. But sometimes even people in this congregation, I'm not talking about outside, just in this congregation, if you would go and reread what you post on Facebook, it's misery. It's misery. You give people every reason why they should not want to be a Christian by watching what you do. So think about what you post and think about your attitude. And I'm not for five seconds talking about putting some plastic phony show on to say, I'm filled with joy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being able to face whatever comes before you and never lose your joy. Yes, we'll be sad. And yes, there'll be days that don't go the way we wish they would go, but it will not steal your joy. And so let's talk about that from this text this morning. And again, a text that really came to my mind that I think is one that we could maybe use as a side text today 
is a text that I found out of Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. You've probably heard this verse before. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. If you think about that, what it's basically saying is whatever's on the inside of you will eventually make its way to the outside of who you are. The Bible says, out of the overflow and abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Did you know that? You can really tell what's in someone's heart by just listening to them. But ultimately, as a man thinks, it says, so he is. And so the idea is this, whatever you're thinking on the inside is really one day going to come out of who you are and be seen by the whole world. So what you think really matters. So if you say today, you think today that you're a victim, it's going to have a big toll on who you are in your life. It's going to dictate decisions you make and feelings that you have and attitudes that you carry. If you think today that you're a failure then it's going to dictate the way that you live your life. You're going to live in a really different way than what you might think. But if you think today that you're a son of the, or daughter of the living God, that you are not perfect, but you have a perfect God who loves you despite who you are. Despite our sin, he demonstrated his love for us. If you believe that and you think those types of thoughts, it's also going to influence your life. So we can gain joy and we can give joy away. And I want all of us to leave today knowing exactly how to do that. So let's walk through this little outline that I've given to you today. The first thing is, the first thing you need to do, there's at least six things I discovered in this text today, at least six ways that basically we can do what I'm talking about. We can gain joy and we can give joy away. Number one, write this down, stand firm, stand firm. He says in chapter four, verse one, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So the first thing he does is, if you'll write this down, notice Paul's encouragement. The first thing he does is he grants encouragement. And by the way, I mention this every time it's in the scripture this way. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, he is not talking here to lost people. He's talking to people that are Christians. He's talking about people that are children of God, okay? And the promises of God are specifically in this case for those that are in Christ Jesus, so the first encouragement he gives is this. He says, again, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. He calls them two things, my joy and my crown. He thinks about them. He prays for them. In fact, if you remember back in chapter 1, he said this in the first few verses of the whole book of the Bible. He says here in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. He remembers their faithfulness, and when he does that, he says, you're my joy. When I think about you, I'm chained in a dungeon right now to a guard, and I'm thinking about you right now. When I think about you, it brings great joy to my life. Are there some people in your life that maybe you've been estranged from, or maybe you're not with them anymore, they live somewhere else, but every time you think about them, it just brings joy to your heart. I've got all kinds of people in my life pastor friends of mine that we don't live close together and we talk by phone every now and then or maybe through an email or whatever but I'd give anything just to spend some time with them and when I think about them and I think about those memories and I think about their friendship and their faithfulness to me it brings great joy to my life and so he's saying I'm in this horrible situation but when I'm thinking about you and when I'm praying for you it just brings joy to my heart you're my joy then he says you're my crown it's a very interesting word, actually, in Greek. The actual word is, is uh, stephanos. Stephanos. It literally means a wreath that is given to a winner. When in that day, maybe an Olympic event or something like that, when someone won the, ru- the race, they would put a wreath around their neck. You've seen that before. The best way I could really come up with an idea that we would understand today is a trophy. A trophy. A trophy is something that brings back memories, doesn't it? And I I just so so happened to have a couple right over here. The the only two, I don't know why these are the only two trophies I have there in my office. I honestly don't know why. I have a few. I've won some things in my life, and that was a long time ago in my life, but I'll grab them in order here. 1981. (laughs) That's a couple years ago, isn't it? 1981, if I can read without my glasses, Hickson High School, Mr. Basketball, Phil Griffin, first place. 1981. I was not the best basketball player on my team, in my opinion. Paul Simmons, and Paul may be even watching this day, he watches it. Paul Simmons was the best basket player, basketball player on the team. But this wasn't voted on by the players, it was voted on by the student body. 
And for some reason, here's exactly what happened. I, you talk about memories. Trophies bring back memories, don't they? I'm sitting and we're having a, I had 1,400 students in my high school in three grades. It was a pretty large school. You know, we're talking, oh, what over, man, that's over 400 students in each grade. And so we're having a, a pep rally or something like that. And I remember we were all in the gym. And when we all got in the gym, it filled the gym completely up. I mean, Hickson High School's gym was not the biggest in the world, but we're in there like cordwood. And I'm talking to my buddy, and they're up there talking, giving some presentations and stuff. And I'm not even paying attention. I'm talking to my buddy about who knows what. And all of a sudden he goes, Phil, they just called your name. I went, what are you talking about? They just called your name. You're supposed to go up on the stage. And I didn't even know when they called my name that I was supposed to go up and receive this trophy. I wasn't the best player on the team. I was a good basketball player. I don't think I was the best. But it brings back memories that maybe the students in my grade thought I was a pretty good guy or whatever it may be. But that brings back a few memories, right? How about this trophy? A few years later, 1990, I'm 26 or 27 years old, a baby preacher. I'm in my first church in Mississippi, Meridian, Mississippi. I'm literally a baby. I hardly know what I'm doing, probably. And I got invited to go to a place in Jackson, Mississippi, and play in a state golf tournament with all these preachers. There were several hundred pastors from all over the state of Mississippi that came together to play in a golf tournament. It was a two-day tournament, an individual tournament. And guess who won the tournament? It says right here, if I can read correctly... It was, and I can't read it right here. It says, Mississippi State Baptist Pastors Tournament Champion. I beat all of them. <laughs> I'm probably the best preaching golfer you ever saw back in those days. So some memories, right? Those are memories. Those are trophies that I still have. And I got a bunch of other trophies at the house for different things. I don't know why those were in my office. But when I thought about it last night, I thought I'd just bring, I'm not doing that to brag. I'm saying that brings back a whirlwind of memories. Those are trophies. I think what Paul was saying to these believers that the church at Philippi was, you're my trophies. <laughs> he won every one of them to the Lord. All of them came to Christ because of his influence. And when he looked at them, they were like trophies of grace to him. They, just a whirlwind of memories and good things. And those, those bring back great, great memories in my life. They're, all my memories back then weren't great, but those are and he said, when I think about you, you're like a trophy. I just, I reminisce about, I, I remember when you prayed to give your life to Christ. Or I remember when you, you took from being a baby believer and you were telling someone else how to be a believer. And you were doing this work for the Lord. And you dedicated yourself to do this. And you're just trophies of grace. You're my joy. You're my crown. The man's in prison He's chained to someone. It's probably rat infested. It probably stunk to the high heavens. I've seen pictures of what they believe this was probably like. Literally a hole in the ground with a grate over the top of it. And he's in this place and he's saying, I don't just have joy in my heart. When I think about you and pray about you, you're my joy. You're my crown. You're my trophies. Man, he's giving them encouragement even from a jail cell. He says, number one, I want to encourage you. Number two, this idea of standing firm. Number two, notice his exclamation. This word to stand here is interesting. It's actually the word stiko. Stiko, it literally means it's an imperative tense. It means to stand, and it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a suggestion. It's a military command. It's like you stay in this pot, you stay in this part, you guard this gate, whatever it is. If you have to guard it with your life, you stand and guard it with your life. It was not a suggestion. And I was never in the military, but everybody I've talked to is in the military. When your commanding officer told you to do something, you better do it. There were consequences if you didn't. So he's not saying here, if you don't have anything else to do, folks, let me just suggest maybe you stand. No, he's saying, you need to stand. Stand on the things that I taught you. Don't give these things up so easily. Literally, he's, he's literally saying that. It's a military command. And just in case, I thought someone might say, well, that's probably a you know, one place in the Bible he did this. Listen to these other places that Paul said this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, stand firm, let nothing move you. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, stand firm in the faith. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In Ephesians 6, verse 11, take the stand against the devil. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, having done everything to stand. In Ephesians 6, verse 14, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled about your waist. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, stand firm in one spirit. In Colossians 4, verse 12, stand firm in all the will of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, stand firm and hold to the key teachings that I passed on to you. You think maybe it's a resounding theme? He's saying if you really want to make a difference and you really do want to not just have joy in your life but give that joy away, you're going to have to stand on the things that you say you believe. Listen, game time and play time is over when it comes to being a believer. We're probably entering into some very difficult days as a nation. I share with our group on Wednesday night, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, George Barna just released statistics saying there are fewer people in the United States that claim membership to a church than don't. I'm, think about that. There are more people in America for the first time since the founding of this nation that claim they are not a member of a church than do. That's never happened in the history of this nation. And that's at an accelerated pace. So if you think being a Christian is the cool thing to do and everybody's going to applaud, they're probably less and less going to do that. And it's going to take more guts to stand up for your faith than it has before. And many are falling away. And so he says, stand firm. If we really want to be a person that makes a difference, we're going to have to stand firm. Number two, sustain an atmosphere of hope. I'm I'm sorry. Number two, settle your differences. I'm sorry. I I pressed on too far. Settle your differences. I love this text. In verse two, in verse three, it says, as I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. This is really good. Settle your differences. One of the greatest problems of the body of Christ are people that are in the body of Christ that have a problem with each other. As they choose to just ignore each other, or I'm just going to go to a different class, or I'm just going to gossip about them over here, and they can gossip about me over there, and I'm going to have my side of my friends, and they can have their side of friends, and that's not God's will ever. Here's two women. I'm not going to pick on that. There's just two women in the church that aren't getting along, Okay. By the way, they are believers because it just said their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They're believers, and they're at odds with one another. We don't know exactly what's going on. And it's interesting to me that Paul doesn't point out what's going on. He doesn't choose sides. He doesn't say, here's what's going on, and here's who's right, here's who's wrong. He just says, settle it. Fix it. You have to lay your pride down to do that, don't you? Sometimes you're the one who's been done wrong, but the best thing you could ever do for yourself is just forgive them. That doesn't mean you have to go to them and look them in the face and say, I've forgiven you. You can go to the Lord and forgive them. When you do that, if you can see what happens with the spiritual eyes that only God has, when you choose to forgive someone, all the chains and all the weight falls off of you. Did you know that? You don't realize that when you're holding that grudge, you're dragging that ball and chain everywhere you go. You think you're free, but you're not free. And you don't have to go to that person and say, oh, by the way, in front of the whole world, I forgive you. That's not what that is. You can go to the Lord and say, God, they did me wrong, but I choose to forgive. And I choose as best I can to forget. And when you do that, you set yourself free. You don't need them to agree with it or not. You can make that choice in your life. So he says to these two women, you you ready for this? I looked up the names of their their names and what they mean. You ready for this? Yodia means sweet smell, and Syntyche means friendly. So think about that. Sweet smell and friendly can't get along. Isn't that great in the church? (laughs) They can't get along. And all Paul says is this. I'm not going to choose sides. I'm not going to even point out what's wrong. You need to fix it. Many years ago, I told this story. I won't tell the whole story. I tell it every time I teach the new members class. I'm preaching a revival at First Baptist Church in Chickamauga, Georgia. It's a nice crowd, about 500 people in a similar setting like this, a center aisle, big First Baptist Church with a balcony, full house. And that night, the pastor had asked if he thought it was a great idea at the end of the service that we had the Lord's Supper to end this revival. And I said, you know, I've never done that before. I've never been a part of a service that did that at the end of a revival. I think it's a great idea. It's your church. If that's what you want us to do, that's what we'll do. And I'll never forget the whole time, and I told the group, and you've been through the class, you've heard me tell this story, but I'm not the kind of person that uses gimmicks and games when I preach. 
And I never have done this before in my life before or since that I remember ever, but something on my heart said, there's somebody sitting over here. And I said, and there's somebody sitting over here. And you used to be close. You used to be together, and now you're distant, you're apart. And now it's the time to lay that down. We're fixing to have the Lord's Supper. Here's the time. How could you participate in the Lord's Supper and hold that grudge one minute longer? And so we prayed to start the, the invitation service. I called the pastor forward, and I got out of the way. And I'll never forget, as the people stood to their feet, a man, an older man in this section, ran to the center aisle. And a younger man from this section ran to the center aisle, and the two men embraced one another. And I, I really quickly figured out, just standing on the stage and watching this, that I was the only person in the room that didn't know what was going on. That's, a, that's an awkward place to be, isn't it? When you're the only guy that doesn't have a clue. And these two men, it was awkward because they just didn't even move on with the service. They did, it's just like it was a pause. It was a victory. I saw people crying and people saying hallelujah. And, all, and again, I'm out of the loop. But they embraced for a long time, not for a few seconds, but for a long time. And I still remember when they, when they let go of one another, one of them's whole chest right here was soaking wet from the tears from the other man. And I told you all this story. Bethany, my 29-year-old, was about a one-year-old at that time. And I told the pastor, when we finish the service tonight, I know it's a long drive to get home. I think I was somewhere around five to six hours from home. But I'm going home. I, I miss my wife and I miss my baby. And so I'll never forget after the service was over, I'm like, I can't leave. We didn't have cell phones back then. I'm like, I got to know what that was all about. And he said, Phil, you just don't know this, but that was a father and his son. They work in the same business. And years ago, they had a falling out. But one's in the senior adult section at church and the other's in the young married couples. And they can go to church and never even have to look at each other. And they've been doing that for years. But that day... They realized, how can I gather around the Lord's table and hold that grudge for one more minute? How can I claim to be a believer for one more minute and do this anymore? And, and whatever reason, the Holy Spirit brought them back together. What a beautiful victory that is. So someone's done you wrong, whether they're in the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ or wherever it may be, let it go. Maybe today's the day you just get along with God and say, God, I still hurt. And what they did to me was wrong. And I don't know how, but, but God, would you please help me? I want to forgive them. I want to remember it no more. And I won't hold this grudge a minute longer. I'm just going to let it go. If that is a person that you know well, maybe you do need to say, let's go get a lunch one day and sit with them and figure that thing out. But don't call yourself a fully devoted follower of Christ and hold grudges with anybody in the body of Christ. He says, fix it. Settle your differences. You're not going to be a joy-filled person able to give joy away if you're holding grudges against anybody on this planet. And so let it go. Fix it. Straighten it out. And again, settle your differences. Number three, I, I jumped ahead, but here we are. Sustain an atmosphere of hope. Look what he says in verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. This is the only of these attributes that's repeated, which always means it's very, very important. He says rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say always rejoice. Notice number one, the statement, rejoice. The word rejoice is a simple word. It's, it's, it's the word charitit, charitit, charitit is the way you say it. It says present and it's a present imperative, which if that doesn't mean anything to anybody in the room except this to say it's a continual habitual practice. In other words, he doesn't say for these next five minutes, why don't you rejoice? Why don't you walk in a rejoicing attitude at all times. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. That may be a hard thing for you to do, but it shouldn't be. Walk in a continual state of rejoicing in your life. Again, this is regardless of your circumstances. How do you do that? How do you rejoice even when it doesn't seem like it's possible to rejoice? Well, here's the example, Paul. How could Paul in that prison chained to a guard He's, he's on trial for something that's unfair, that's not right. There's nothing right about it. His hands are in the place of someone that he doesn't even know if he's going to be alive tomorrow. They could come in at any moment, and one day they did come in and lead him away to kill him. He didn't know when that day was coming. How could he have even talked about rejoicing? How could he talk about joy? Again, it's because his joy was not tied to his circumstances. 
They were tied to the bedrock of his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, say, Phil, you don't know what I've been through. I don't have to know what you've been through. Have you been through that? So you say, Phil, I don't, give me a reason. How can I have a reason to rejoice? Well, that's the second point here is notice the source, not just a statement. Notice the source. He says, rejoice in the Lord, not rejoice in your circumstances, rejoice in the Lord. That's the difference, right? If you again are tying your, your joy to what's going to happen in your life today, man, that's, that's just rolling the dice every day, isn't it? You never have to roll the dice if you're banking on Jesus being on the throne tomorrow. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you in this area of rejoicing. You rejoice no matter what happens tomorrow if you're really banking on Him being Lord of your life. And so I just wrote a few things down. You're sitting here today, well, I don't really have a good reason to rejoice. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I don't care. The person that's been through the worst, worst month, worst year, worst life ever. How about this? If you're a Christian, your sins have been forgiven. Is that enough? Man, you have Christian friends. You have a wonderful church family around you that loves you, that really does love you. This church doesn't play games with that. There's no fake and phony here. We run people off that want to be that. We don't want them here. I teach a new members class and tell repeatedly for three straight weeks, if you want to be that kind of person, we don't want you. I'm serious about that. I don't want to be a part of a family when somebody says, I'm praying for you. I know they're actually praying for me. Or I love you. They really do love me. I'm here for you. How can I help you? Call me anytime. They mean it. Man, if you're part of this church family, you've got all kinds of reasons to rejoice. How about this? We have God's word to guide us. I have a place to go for solutions that really do matter. that are not fleeting and for the moment. They're eternal. How about this? I have God's Holy Spirit living within my heart. Can I go on? You have every reason in the world to walk around in an attitude of rejoicing at all times, no matter how bad the day's been. And I'm not saying you should never be sad. I'm not saying you, should not, you shouldn't be real about what's going on in life. I'm just saying above that, listen to me, that supersedes your circumstances. There's just something behind it that says it's a, it, it's a, it backs everything to say, I'm in Christ He's for me, not against me. My joy is tied to him. He is my source, not this government, not my friends, not anything in this world. He's my source. If he's your source, he's real, really your source, you'll find all kinds of reasons to rejoice. So sustain an atmosphere of hope. Have every reason to be walking in hope every day because of that, right? Number four, seek to maintain a gentle spirit. I thought this was really interesting. In verse five, he says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. This word gentle is a really interesting word. It's so complex that most scholars believe there's not even one word that'll fully describe what this word means. Here's some of the attempts that I read about. Here's some attempts to define this word. See, sweet reasonableness, generous friendliness, charity, merciful, big-hearted is another word that I found that talks about this word. I think the best description in the whole Bible about it is his words, the page before in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Listen to these words. Do, not, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but the interest of others. If in your everyday life you were spending more time being concerned about someone else than you are concerned about yourself, you'll have no issue with this, with this topic, right? But if it's all about you and you've got to be happy and it's all got to go your way, you're probably never going to be satisfied. You're never going to have joy in your life if that's what it's all about. If you're busy just worrying about the other, here's what amazing things happen in your life when you do it God's way. He gives you the joy. He gives you what you need not anything from this world. And so if your focus is on yourself, you're going to have a hard time with this. But if it's not, if your focus is on others and meeting those others' needs, you'll have a gentle spirit in this world. Number five, be sure to pray about everything. Be sure to pray about everything. We're talking about how can I have joy in my life, but not just joy in my life. How can I make sure I'm giving it away to others? Well, you need to learn to pray about everything. Write these two things down. Number one, our responsibility. 
In verse 6, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Our responsibility is given to us right at the beginning. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything we should pray, right? So, instead of wasting time and energy on worrying about things, I ought to spend that time praying about those things, right? And I'm, I'm the chief of all sinners. Man, I'm as good at worrying as anybody in this room. I could probably get about a two-foot trophy for being a worrier. I'm good at it. I don't want to be good at it. I just, I am. I'm, I'm admitting it to you. And I suspect I'm not the only person in the room who's prone to do that. Instead of wasting my time, because every moment I've ever spent in my life worrying about something was wasted time. Most things that we worry about in life, we have zero control over. So it does a zero good to, to worry about it, right? So instead of being anxious about that, I should have been spending my time praying about that. And when I do that, amazing things happen in life. And so my responsibility, your responsibility, is to remember that what, whatever I'm facing in life, the very first thing I should do is pray about it. That's why I wear these armbands saying pray first, right? Not pray second or last. We pray first. And so instead of worrying about something, my responsibility is to pray about it. Number two, notice our reward. What happens when a person refuses to worry about things and chooses to pray about things? Well, look at verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's two words I chose to underline that I want to bring attention to. Number one, it says, and the peace of God. Stay with me for a minute. Not peace with God, the peace of God. If we could just be a fly on the wall in heaven right now, do you think there's a panic going on in heaven right now? You think the Lord's going, what if the stock market goes down tomorrow? What if they raise taxes? What if Biden becomes the president? What if they pass this new law? Really? You know what's going on at the Godhead right now? Complete and utter peace. And he didn't just say here, when you pray, instead of worry, I'll, I'll give you some peace in your life. He said, I'll give you my peace. Wow. Wow. His peace. Boy, I want some of that, don't you? You can't buy it. You, they don't even have that on the shelves at Sam's, you know. But if we can get it, if we'll pray, he says, here's what's going to happen. Instead of worrying about things, if you'll pray about things, the very peace of God will overwhelm you. That's a wonderful thing. And we've all experienced that. But notice he says this, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will. Not might, or if you're lucky, or if you're the third. Years ago, I got in line at an airport in Chicago. I needed to be home really bad. I had a, it was bad timing on my part. I understand that, but I'd, I'd, my plane had get, gotten canceled the day before. I never had that happen ever in my life until that day. I know if you've flown a lot, you probably had it happen, but I, I had a, a wedding rehearsal the next day. And so I got to the airport mega early. They had got me on a different flight. And I found out when I got there, they had me on standby, which is a whole big mess. I fussed and fought and figured out. And I finally had to go get in one of these lines. It was right after 9-11. They had lines a mile long to get through those things. And, and I, I, was, I was smart enough to stand aside and just kind of watch. And they were stopping like every fifth person and making them basically take all their clothes and shoes and whatever off and whatever. So you know me. I wasn't a math major at all, but I could count to five. <laughs> and I think I was like three, and I'm like, man, I'm good. And so we got up there, and of course, that was the only time, probably in that whole line, they chose to pick number three. And so I'm taking shoes off, whatever. I literally ran. I didn't even put my shoes on. I grabbed my stuff, and I ran down through that horrible airport in Chicago. No offense, my brother. <laughs> O'Hare. Ran down through the and literally ran onto the plane as they were shutting the doors. I kind of was the last guy through. It was the most amazing thing in the world. You know what? Aren't you glad God doesn't go, you know what? I'm sorry, but you were the fifth one to call. Call again sometime later. Leave a voicemail. I might call you back later. He says, if you will pray instead of worry, you can count on it. The very peace of God will. That's a promise. It's not a promise from Paul. It's a promise from God. He will do this in your life. And so again, one more time, verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. It won't make any sense 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything. One last thing. We're, we're talking about how can I get joy in my life to the measure that I can just give it away to other people? How can I be a conduit of God's joy in the world? Every one of you probably knows someone. I'm not trying to, don't point right now, okay? This is all, if you just think about it. Every one of you probably knows somebody, maybe even in this room, that when you see them coming, you can't wait to talk to them. You can't wait to see them. And if you're being honest, some of you see some people coming, and you're like, oh no, here we go. I'm just going to take one for the team, right? Because it's going to be, woe is me. It could be sunshine outside, but for them it's raining, right? It can be beautiful outside and beautiful blue skies, but this foggy and, and going to rain later today and lightning storms and it's going to flood, right? It's just, it's, they're never happy. Yet they claim, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a billboard for why I should never give my life to Christ. And you don't even realize it. It's because you have built your whole life and your joy on the things of this world instead of a God who loved you so much he sacrificed his life for you. And so one last thing, how can I have some of this joy that I can give away is set your mind on holy thoughts. And I thought this is great the way this ends. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's any worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Your thought life matters so much more than you realize. What you choose to dwell on, what you choose to look upon with your eyes and to listen to with your ears, it matters greatly. What you think about matters unbelievably. And so just to make sure you understand this, gentlemen, you can't be spending time looking at pornography and claim to be in a right relationship with Jesus. It does not work that way. You can't be watching trashy movies and reading, ladies, some of these books that are horrible, that got terrible. Life. Well, I don't, it doesn't bother me that much. Yes, it does. What you think about matters greatly because what you think about will eventually come out of your life. And so he presents us a really great challenge here. One more time. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. You know why? Because if you'll dwell on those things, that's what will come out of your life. The reason your life is so pathetic and you're so miserable all the time is because you're probably thinking about the wrong stuff. Get your mind out of the gutter, and I promise you things will change in your life. Set your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ in the things of God. It will change your life. Think on those things. I can't think on those things if I'm not reading his word and dwelling on his word and getting to church and being around people that are studying the word together. Think on those things. I read a study. I couldn't believe this. I really had to think about this for a minute. The average human being has more than 10,000 thoughts a day. Think about that. I believe that. I mean, I, I, I've started thinking to myself, I've just had three in the last two seconds. You know, 10,000 thoughts a day. Again, I'm not a mathematician, but I do have a calculator. Y'all ready with me? And I had to double check myself because I'm not even good with a calculator. But here's what that adds up to. 3.5 million thoughts every year. And in case you know how to do math, you're probably already there. That is, by the way... 260 million thoughts in a lifetime. You think it matters what you think about? If you're thinking about negative stuff all the time, you know what's going to come out of your life? You're going to reap what you've sown. You're going to be negative all the time. If you're walking around thinking you're a victim because you don't have or it didn't work out the way you had it planned or you didn't win the golf tournament or you weren't Mr. Basketball or whatever, then you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. What you think about matters more than you realize. And so if you'll set your eyes and your mind and your thoughts and your talk and everything that you do in your life on the things of God, you'll see a drastic change in your life. And what you'll find out is you'll have joy in your life. Because the verse that I quoted at the beginning I think is so true. As a man thinks within himself, so he is. 
So if I'm thinking about how miserable my life is, I'm probably going to be miserable. If I'm thinking about how unfair life has been to me, then I'm probably going to be miserable. If I think about that person that said that horrible thing about me way back in high school, and I haven't gotten over it yet, it's, just, it's destroying the joy in my life now. If I'm willing to set those things free to say, God, I forgive whoever that was, I don't even want to think about that anymore. I'll set my eyes upon you. Instead of worrying about those things, I'm going to pray to you and let you give peace in my life. And what will happen in your life is you'll be so filled with joy that people are going to want to be around you. They'll want to be around you. They'll want to hear the things you have to say. They'll want to know the thoughts that you have about that. They may even seek you out for wisdom in life because you are a person that they're drawn to because of the Jesus they'll see in you. I ask you this question. When people see you coming, honestly, are they glad to see you coming? Or they wish they could hide and you not see them and maybe not have to deal with you? There are a lot of people I know that are believers, claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's like, I can't, the pastor's got to deal with it, right? Y'all can, y'all can be mean to him, walk away, but I can't do that, right? I've been a pastor for 32 years. For some reason, my office has always been the one at the end of the hallway with no escape. <laughs> I told you my pastor, Fred Stillman, had an escape door at the side of his office. And I bet you there was a time or two when he heard a voice coming down the hall, he just skated out the door and said he had to make a hospital visit or something like that. I can't do that. And by the way, I'll deal with it. I'm glad to. Because my joy in life is to take somebody that looks like they've been sucking on lemons all day and teach them how they can have some joy in their life. What would happen in Cleveland, Tennessee if a group of people this large said, you know what? I will not. I will not let this world destroy the joy in my life. Yeah, we're going to have tough days. That's going to come. We're going to deal with sadness in life. I get that. But we should never let it ever get to the source of the joy in my life and your life which is nothing found in this world. Nothing is found in the absolute faith and trust that I placed in a Savior that loved me so much. He gave everything he had for me so that I could spend my eternity with him. We were talking just yesterday about Miss Angel. We didn't want to watch her suffer one day longer. And isn't it great to know today she's not suffering at all. She's at complete peace. No cancer, no nothing to deal with at complete peace because she's with the Prince of Peace. That's our future. But oh, wouldn't it be great if we could expose some of that while we're still here and be conduits of His grace and mercy and His encouragement to this world because, listen to me, the world is starving for something that's genuine and real. And again, I'm not asking you to plastic and phony anything. I'm asking you to put your full trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and bank on that for your joy. If that happens, I think that you will gain joy And you'll constantly give it away to others. I want to be that person, don't you? Father, we love you. Thank you, God, that we have such a great example in Paul. I can't even imagine, God, how a man in prison, unfairly in prison, God, up on Trump charges that measured up to nothing, chained to a guard, and perhaps able just to dictate to someone to write down the thoughts on his heart that were given by you would even mention the word joy. But God, he didn't just mention it once. He mentioned it 16 times. Even as he thought of the people that he had had the privilege to work with in in years before, it brought joy to his heart. God, I know that everyone in this room really does want to be a conduit of your joy in this world. We're not interested in being plastic and phony, God. We want to be real. We want the whole world to know that if we're banking on whether the stock market goes up tomorrow or gas prices come down or whatever it may be, we're in in for a miserable ride. But there's such consistency in your faithfulness. So God, we will bank our lives on you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your patience with us. Thank you so much, God, that you do desire to see that joy come from our lives to the point that you're willing to invest in our lives. And I pray today, God, more than anything in the world, that just thinking through this passage of Scripture and seeing this man write about this could spur us to desire to have more joy and less misery. To be so filled with your joy, God, that we could literally spill out upon the people that come across our path. 
that when we leave someone's presence, God, there'll be a little more joy in their life because they encountered us that day. That's the work of God. We can't do this, God. We can't figure this out on our own. There's no formula that works in our ability. It's a gift from you. And so fill us with your joy. Lord, if there's someone in this room that's at odds with someone, maybe even in this room, I doubt that, but there, there could be someone that has a problem with somebody in this room. God, may that end today. Maybe even right now. I pray, Father, we would be free from those types of things and, and that we'd be free, Father, not to, to worry about the things in this world, but to set our focus completely on you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you may know all the songs about Jesus and you can quote some scriptures about Jesus, but that doesn't save you. Going to church doesn't save you. Being baptized doesn't save you. Only a relationship with Jesus will save you. And the great news is this, God desires that relationship even more than you do. If, we, if you would confess your sin to him even right now, ask him to forgive you of your sin, to wash you clean in the blood of Calvary, and to save your soul, he will do exactly that. If you mean business with him, he'll mean business with you. You can be set free of your sin. Would you cry to him now? You're in this room and you know that you're a believer, but you also know you've been following some, from so far away. You've been satisfied with being distant from God. But you know you can't be filled with joy and walk at a distance from God. Maybe today's the day you draw near. Maybe it's the day you come to this altar and say, God, I'm tired of following you from afar. Draw me near. Forgive me and cleanse me and draw me near. What is it you need to do today? to make sure when you leave this place, you're filled with his joy and able to give it away to others. That's my question. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your presence in this room and all things are possible because of you. There's nothing that's too hard for you. And so would you draw us near? Would you help us, Father, have a burden, not just to be a person of joy, but to give that joy away in this world because there'll never be joy in this world if there's not submission to you as Lord. And so help us, God, we pray in Jesus' name. We're so honored that you joined us today. I trust the message was an encouragement to you. Please stay connected with us through social media. It's there you can get updates on all that's going on here at the church and future events that we'll be having. If you'd like to give to this ministry so we can continue to bring this type of ministry to you, please go to gracepoint.church slash give. It's there you can make a donation. So again, we can continue to bring these messages to you. Remember to like and subscribe. We'd love for you to do that. That way, every time that we go live, you'll be notified. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.